That sound, listeners, was me opening a bottle of my very favorite productivity beverage, Club Mate, which you can get now in the U.S. in some places. It's it's effectively a yerba mate soda that I started drinking in Berlin because you get dehydrated when you're doing ketamine and then eventually you get tired when you're at one of those like underground sex clubs that's open for four days in a row and Club re- Mate, it's really, really, <laughs> really hits the spot. I like how they let you in the club and not Elon Musk, Robert. Yeah, because I didn't I didn't bring my phone, you know, that's, right. <laughs> that's, that's why a, they let me in. <laughs> you, you weren't wearing a dumbass Zorro mask. They were, yeah, you, yeah. You I, had... I can be separated from Twitter occasionally. <laughs> yeah. Now, speaking of guys who are not allowed in German sex clubs, <laughs> John George Schmitz. Uh, that That's is the bastard my for our name episode. Too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whenever we go out, the people always shout. They go, John George Smith is a piece of shit. La 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 la. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he's pro- he's got to be related to John Jacob Jingleheimer. You know, they both have <laughs> the Schmitz at the end, more or less. So. Our John Schmitz was born on August 12th, 1930 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, at the very mouth of hell itself. Now, there are unfortunately few details that I ran into on his very early life. Uh, his mother was named Wilhelmina, which is a red flag, right? That name, <laughs> in 1930, that name means I love Kaiser Wilhelm, or at least my parents did. Um <laughs> And his father was Jacob John. There you go. There they he go. does basically between him and his dad, <laughs> Jacob. Jacob John Schmitz. <laughs> You're joking. Um, that's a, that's a bad. no, no, where's no. The, that's him, baby. Where's wow. the Jingleheimer? Was that just like a like a sort of unknown SS officer? Look, 1930, you still did get some people who were anti-German racist. I would not be surprised if Jingleheimer was a slur, like specifically. <laughs> really, it's, it's like sausage eater. Yeah, <laughs> totally, totally, totally. Schnitzel heads. Yeah. Um, they were devout Catholics. Uh, John would remain a devout Catholic his entire life. And again, we, we don't know nearly as much about his childhood, but his family seems to have been comfortable, middle class or upper middle class. There's some hints that he may have had a degree of family money, but it is unclear. Whatever it was, either it wasn't that much or his parents still wanted him working a job. And he did have a job as a young man, scrubbing out vats of beer. That will be relevant for a very stupid reason later. Um, okay. His family was, again, comfortable. Comfortable enough that he's able to go straight from high school into college, where he received a BS at Marquette University in 1952 and subsequently joined the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, he qualified initially as a jet fighter pilot and then as a helicopter pilot. From what I can see, he didn't do any combat tours. He was instead stationed in North Carolina uh, and then Japan, flying F 2 H 4 Banshees and F 9 F 8 Cougars. Part of why I think he doesn't actually get sent anywhere, because obviously the U.S. during the time he's, you know, in the military, like is in Korea. Um, And then kind of while he is still in the military, we start being in Vietnam. But he is in the Marines and he is part Mm -hmm. of like kind of an experimental Marine air wing. The Marines really hadn't had like that previously to the same extent that they did, at least with jet fighters. And so his unit is not sent anywhere because they're still trying to figure out if like that's a thing that they think will work for the Marine Corps. His career is then of little note, but for one fact, which is that after he retires from active duty in 1960 and transitions to being a reserve officer, he volunteers to teach a class on communism for the Fleet Marine Force Pacific Leadership School, which is based at the El Toro Marine Corps base. And the El Toro Marine Corps base is in, you guessed it, Orange County, California. (laughs) Now, doing this series of anti-communism lectures seems to have basically been an excuse for Schmitz to rant about communist plots to conquer the world and how peace is impossible with the Soviet Union and China to an audience of young men who then went over to Vietnam and did the kind of things that you did in Vietnam, most of which are not very nice. Um, His lesson plan seems to have been deeply inspired by Frederick Schwartz's, again, a lot of Schwarzy names flying Mm -hmm. around here, very frustrating, but Frederick Schwartz's anti anti-communism school. And so given the mood at the time, the fact that this dude is doing basically the the version of this big public anti-communism school 
that the Knott's Berry Farm guy is funding and that this this Australian fascist is doing the lesson plan, lesson plan for. The the fact that John Schmitz is like doing a uh, a class on communism for the military, it makes him fit in really well with this whole whole fucking zeitgeist, right? Yeah. Upon leaving active duty in 1960, he became a history and philosophy professor at Santa Ana College. He quickly became a fixture in the arch conservative Orange County political scene. He joined the John Birch Society. He also attracted the attention of local far-right businessmen, including Carl Karcher, the founder and namesake of the Carl's Jr. fast food empire. Everything. Truly everything. Really, really a remarkable set of things there, right? Knott's Berry Farm. (laughs) I love that both the Knott's Berry Farm and the Carl's Jr. are funding the fascist movement. Yeah, seriously. What else? Like, like the giraffe from Toys R Us is just is a mm-hmm. fucking oh like oh he 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 actually is in Leavenworth still for crimes he committed during yeah. the Vietnam War. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, went, yeah. Uh, Joffrey went 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 too far for even yeah for even even the army in that <laughs> is period. That what his name was that's right. Yeah, Joffrey. Joffrey is the name Joffrey. of the giraffe who, who, who Joffrey has had the just idea a of, mountain of blood behind him. Yeah, he he had the, yeah the, the My Lai massacre was his mm-hmm. idea. Yeah, um, yeah, he invented the concept of saturation bombing. That, that was him, <laughs> um, Joffrey like, j- the giraffe. He, he's made of Agent Orange. Like what other yeah. loved? <laughs> <laughs> they 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 got it from glands in his skin. <laughs> and foliated the jungle. <laughs> um, Seriously, oh, if though, only I could blame a giraffe for all of our country's worst crimes. I know. Um, alas, so alas, we'll blame the. Um, Schmitz, you know, he gets out of the military. He becomes a history and philosophy professor at Santa Ana College, and he quickly becomes a fixture in 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 this political scene, right? And he, he's he's working with the Carl's Jr. guy, with the Knott's Berry Farm guy. Um, he had married while he was still in the Marine Corps to a significantly younger woman. Uh, I'm not sure exactly, but one newspaper I found from when he was like in his 40s described her as youthfully pretty in contrast to him. So I'm going to guess a decent bit younger. Mary is just as conservative as her husband and almost as hungry for power but i'm i'm getting ahead of myself here so Mm. in 1962 right the family schmitz get their uh their first daughter a a young girl named mary Kay, and we will be talking about who mary Kay schmitz becomes a little bit later because i i I think it might surprise you not that mary Kay. Uh, (laughs) another not not the cult leader not that mary Kay. no 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 don't forget she exists though because boy howdy it's gonna really be a satisfying end to this series now the same year that mary Kay is born her father would carry out an act of probable heroism that helped make him into a local celebrity he was leaving the Marine Corps base one day after a, a long day of screaming about communism to teenagers when he encountered a man stabbing a woman by the roadside. Quote, with nothing more than the sheer authority of his voice, according to the L.A. Times, Schmitz disarmed the assailant. Right. So the story is he finds this man stabbing a woman and he yells at him and that disar- his voice is so commanding that it disarms this guy. Now, <laughs> that is, I think literally what happened in that this guy Schmitz yells at this guy and he stops the attack. I think that the casual descriptions these sources get tend to minimize a crucial detail. Um, and I, I want to make it very clear that like, that detail is that the woman dies, right? This is not a case where he saves a life by stopping an attack. This is a case where a man stabs a woman to death, probably in a fit of rage. And then someone yells at him and he realizes what he's done and he stops, right? He doesn't, he doesn't commit a spree killing because most killers aren't spree killers, right? Mm. He murders this woman for some specific reason and then someone yells at him and he realizes oh my god what have i done right that's, what did he say that is how like, I t- and, hey, hey don't hey, stab that lady hey knock <laughs> yeah. it off knock it off hey hey knock it off you you crazy kids hey that's enough she's had enough you did it yeah. you like, did it uh, you, again I'm not saying he didn't do anything bad, but like you should, in fact, if you see someone getting in st- stabbed, at least yell at the stabber. Sure. <laughs> you know? The least you could um, do. But it, it it's framed as like he disarmed this man. And I really don't think that's exactly, exactly. They what didn't, happened. They didn't talk about the, the, the 
30 seconds he spent watching it happen and then was like, all right, buddy. <laughs> Tweaking his nipples, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Well, it's also, the thing that's really weird, because I, I, well, I'll shit on him for everything but this. This isn't a bad thing. But the way the news describes it, they always talk about how like cool it is that he disarms this guy with his vo- voice and then just casually announce, oh yeah, the lady died. Like the LA Times just summarizes it this way. Right. Although the woman died, Schmitz's reputation as a hero was made. Just like, yeah, she died, but what a cool thing this guy got to do. Very funny. I love that all of the newspapers write it the same way. It's just this afterthought. I find that darkly interesting. That is funny. It is. It's it's so unremarkable that like it, it only is remarkable yeah. if she lives. It's not remarkable if she dies. Is everyone we, we get that so, right. Stop something. Yeah. Yeah, or if he's like stabbed multiple people and then you could genuinely say, yeah, maybe he somehow stopped more people from getting stabbed. But or, or if all he I'm seeing here stabbed. is you came upon the end of a murder. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. You witnessed the very end of a murder. <laughs> but I, I think if I can put my conspiracy hat on, I think what's happening here is that like Schmitz is a a PR savvy guy. He has a degree of charisma. He knows how to spin things. And as soon as he realizes what's happened here. Like, this is too good a story to waste. I can really make this work for me. And by 1964, Schmitz had become one of Orange County's leading political lights. He is still working as a professor of philosophy and political science at Santa Ana University. And he's already, he's become very active in the John Birch Society. His support for the Carl's Jr. guy and several other wealthy conservatives ensured that he had enough donations to run his campaign. So Schmitz, who regularly joked that he joined the John Birch Society to get moderates to vote for him, comes out blazing in this like local, like state Congress election uh, with a raft of absolutely bugfuck policy proposals. Mm -hmm. He wants to ban sex ed in public schools. He wants to encourage citizens to carry loaded handguns in their cars, which the corollary to that is he wants citizens to leave loaded handguns in their cars whenever they leave their cars. (laughs) He wants to sell all California state universities to private corporations so they can use violence to crack down on student protests against Vietnam. That's why he wants to privatize colleges so that the corporation can use like security guards to beat up students. (laughs) This all occurred during a very special time for the United States, when the most prominent Republican is, again, Barry Goldwater. Barry is such, for an idea of how how freaked out people are about what a fascist this guy is, when Goldwater is running, like is in this campaign, this is LBJ's re-election campaign, right? Mm -hmm. Goldwater, well, not re-election because he was never elected the first time, but you get what I'm saying, right? LBJ's been president a little while since the Kennedy assassination. He's running to continue to get to be president. And- Fidel Castro sends a private letter to LBJ basically saying, hey, man, I really want you to win re-election if you need to bomb us a little bit, right? So you can brush up your anti-communist credentials for the election. I get it. You just give me a heads up before you fuck with us and I won't respond. Like, I love you, bro. Like, good luck out there. Shut up. Shut up. I annoyed. That's hilarious. It is because, like, Castro is a rational actor. He's like, yeah, man, Goldwater might fucking nuke us. Like, he's this guy might actually be crazy. Like, Goldwater is the namesake for what's called the Goldwater rule, which is this rule where if you're a mental health professional, you cannot diagnose a presidential candidate that, like, you know, isn't coming to you for medical help or whatever because there were so many people in the media being like, Goldwater may actually be insane. Uh, uh-huh, like, uh-huh. that's how crazy we think his policies are. Um, and he is, it's also worth noting, Goldwater, a big reason people think he's crazy is that he is one of these guys like Henry Kissinger who thinks low-yield nukes should be used tactically in battlefield <laughs> situations. Like, we need, to, we need to win this battle in Vietnam. We should drop a little nuke on him. So Goldwater's rule is you can't diagnose someone running yes, even if you they're- you should not absolutely saying insane shit. Yeah, you should not use that to diagnose someone with a mental health condition. Someone else or this candidate. Yeah. Okay. This candidate. Like, okay. it, like a, basically, if someone's running for election, you shouldn't say, I, if you haven't like worked on them or whatever and can't, you, know, you shouldn't be like, this person has this mental illness. Right. So we can't um, say Trump, yeah, is a sociopathic narcissist because we don't know clinically yeah, exactly. that he is. Yeah. Yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna get a, a psychologist shouldn't say that, right? That's the Goldwater rule. Um, it's, it's fine for regular people to say I think that guy's a fucking psychopath, right? I think um, we've gone. Yeah, I think that's I think probably we, good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
We might have jumped the shark but on it, this, it, though. I feel like there's a few people yeah, who diagnosed it, it, it's, all... It's, <laughs> Always debatable, but it tells you how crazy people think Goldwater is, yes, right? You have yes. a whole rule about not declaring presidential candidates crazy because of how crazy everyone right, thought this right. guy was. Now, another big thing that Goldwater is a proponent of, and this is a less controversial thing than the nukes, is the idea that positive change for people who aren't white men means that society is in collapse, right? Uh, Goldwater opposes the Civil Rights Act, uh, as does John Schmitz and the rest of Orange County. And this is the beginning of a new era, one in which you can't be as racist, right? You can't say, I don't want the Civil Rights Act because I hate black people, right? Instead, you have to say, I love everybody, but my property rights are more important than that, yes. right? And if you're saying we have to integrate the school, like private schools, if you're saying private schools can't be whites only, that's bad for property rights. Or if you're saying I have to serve black people at my restaurant, that's a violation of property rights. And so I don't I don't oppose the Civil Rights Act because I'm racist. I oppose it because it, it it's a violation of property rights. And that's the most important thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. It, it, this all comes down to like fair housing, right? Yes, exactly. And schooling and fair yeah. education. Yep. Access. Yep, yep. I mean, but but again, it's sort of what's running cover for what your libertarianism running cover for your racism um, and then your religion running cover for all of it, like just like blanketing yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. And, and this this kind of comes to a head in California politics in 1964, because there's this proposition uh, backed by the California Real Estate uh, Association to rescind the Rumford Act, which is a state law that makes it illegal to discriminate housing uh, based mm -hmm. on race. Right. Um, and the proposition to like say, no, we want to be able to be racist in who we let buy houses places is obviously like Orange County had kept black people out for a long time mm -hmm. by doing shit like that. Um, so the mobilization for Prop 14 to like let people discriminate when they sell houses and shit, that's hugely centered around Orange County. And I'm going to quote from the book Suburban Warriors here. Indeed, one activist, Tom Rogers of San Juan Capistrano, who served as the campaign finance manager for John Schmitz's state Senate run in 1964, and who shortly afterwards served as co-editor of the Catholic traditionalist paper The Wanderer, asserted years later that for him and many others, Proposition 14 was what the movement was all about. Goldwater's frequent references of freedom of association, his belief that prejudice is the a moral issue that cannot be legislated, and his strong advocacy of property rights placed him firmly on the side of those opposing the Rumford Act. Moreover, Goldwater's determination to fight lawlessness, his references to rising crime rates, and his linkage of crime to lawlessness of other sorts, a reference to the civil rights and students' movements, appealed to the white middle classes in Orange County. Mm -hmm. So... Goldwater does not succeed in his dream of becoming the president, but Schmitz does get elected to the California State Senate uh, representing Orange County, and he is the first member of the John Birch Society to make it into local California politics. He immediately gets to work being the loudest, craziest asshole uh, in the Capitol. The first full year that he served, 1965, is the year of the Watts riots. Now, if you know anything about anything, you know that this this becomes like a massive political issue for the yeah. right in California. Um, his attitude is not, well, this was a response to generations of abuse by the local government and by the police. This was a communist operation. Of course. Um, he's so incensed that he sponsors a bill to investigate the backgrounds of every public school teacher in the state for communist affiliations. Like his response to the Watts riots is, we need to have build a, a CIA basically to go after after school teachers and make sure they're not communists. That's clearly what this Jesus came from. Jesus Christ. John develops, yeah, he is just, just a maniac. Now, what's interesting, we've been talking a lot about how Reagan is such an important development for like the far right getting increasingly into legitimate conservative politics in this mm -hmm, country. Mm -hmm. John Schmitz hates Reagan. So do a lot of Birchers, the right? Birchers, because right. they see Reagan as a compromiser, right? And a compromiser is the same as a communist sympathizer. Schmitz is the only Republican Senate member who votes down Governor Reagan's 1967 tax program. And his issue is that as much as they'd cut, taxes are still too high. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to quote next from an article in, on cafe.com by David Kurlander. 
Over the next three years, Schmitz took many, often lonely, far-right stands. He argued for eliminating state income taxes altogether. He sponsored a bill to repeal fair housing laws. He argued that there should be no sex education in public schools. He led a successful effort to censure University of California, Berkeley, for allowing Black Panther leader Eldridge Cleaver to speak on campus. He fiercely spoke out against abortion and women's rights. He also continued to buck fellow conservative leaders. Schmitz declined to endorse a presidential candidate in 1968, telling the press, George Wallace is too moderate for me. Hubert Humphrey is taking a dive. And if I endorsed Richard Nixon, he might repudiate it the next day. Like, again, George Wallace is like the guy who became famous for loving segregation as a governor of Alabama. But that's what they want. I mean, that's effectively what this sounds like, right? They can't. They've never gotten over it. And here's my here's what I've realized. Now we're in part two. Could we say as a native Californian myself, I mean, not like, you know, native to the land, but someone who was born and raised in California, obviously nor Cal for life, but that these are a kind of transplants that ultimately the OC is a blight, is a is an anomaly that it's not really California. This is they're all from somewhere else. It's it. Can we disown the OC is what I want to know. I, I feel like you can't because I, I think a, a <laughs> crucial aspect of Californian culture, at least over the last going back 200 years or so, is the gold rush mentality. Yeah. The idea that the culture in this area, and this is a big thing in NorCal too, right? It's a big part yeah, of, yeah. of Northern California, San Francisco culture is like a bunch of the people who live here now are descendants of folks who rushed here to try to grab a bunch of money from a social phenomenon that had a, a ticking time frame to it, right? Right. These upper middle class and rich people who who fill out the OC and who are, you know, these kind of fascist maniacs running the defense industry, that's a gold rush. That is True. one day there's nothing, the next there's all the money in the fucking world and you got to sprint over there as fast as you fucking can to pick it up. Yeah. Totally. It just depends on the industry like Silicon Valley yeah. and the dot com. Silicon boom. Valley is another gold rush. Right. Yes. Same idea. Same cultural. Fun. And so is the pod industry, as a matter of fact. Right. Oh, I thought you said the pod like the podcast. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, actually a little bit. Right. That's less geographically centered than weed or the tech industry, the defense industry or gold. Yeah. True, true, but, true, yes, true. Yes. A little bit less harm, less harm. But it is, you know, California is a state of like the, a lot of our culture is gold rushes and these people embody it right yes um it's not a pretty part of californian heritage but it is it is very much part of it i think yeah although you know you don't need to jettison them as much because things have gotten better we'll see yes. if it lasts right there's there's always as the, we noticed a little bit in the beginning yeah. okay so two so not right wing enough for the birchers and Sh- yes schmitz they hate Nixon. They don't like Reagan much better. Um, they do like him better than Nixon, but not a lot. So Schmitz is he's he, he's one of these guys where he's such a howling fascist. But the Republican Party in this period is not nearly as inviting of that. So most as much as he yells about the left and socialism, all the people he really fights hard in his political career are other Republicans, right? Like he is constantly going to war with Republicans. Now, his wife, Mary, is really interesting, too, because she uses her husband's newfound power and notoriety, the fact that he's gotten elected, he's making all these waves as this just kind of arch bircher in in California Congress. She becomes becomes one of the first female far right media influencers Uh-oh. right she she gets on local tv she becomes a she has eventually she gets like a permanent place on a tv show that's like a politics round table she is just like a frequently wanted speaker. She like gets speaking fees and things going around supporting different candidacies. If she were around today, she'd have a podcast and a blue check Twitter account and she would make seven figures working at the Daily Wire. She yes. is the prototype for that kind of like woman in conservatism. Her her handle, like her bio would be like like mom, wife, American yeah. flag, cross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. And she'd have like really nice arms, which is always the most annoying thing about right wingers is they all have the same trainer and they all have the like just sort of like Mm -hmm. strong arms, which I don't understand (laughs) and simultaneously covet. (laughs) (laughs) You people know what I'm talking about. You guys know that right wingers are terrible, but the women have great. They have their arms are great. You you, you, have only spoken truth. Right. And you're like, I don't know. You definitely can't fight. Like they're not fighting arms. I'm thinking of I'm thinking of Ann Coulter. Yeah. Uh, and and what and Ann Coulter, like the the celebrity that I would compare her to positively, I think this is actually a compliment for her, is Jack Skellington. 
Um, <laughs> yes. No, <laughs> no, no. We should probably cut all of that. <laughs> don't cut that. She would. She would take it as a as a W. She she appreciates yeah. it. Well, we we gotta go to an ad real quick. We sure do. We sure do. Speaking of Jack Skellington, mm. he would want you to participate in capitalism well past Christmas. Yes. He doesn't actually like Christmas all that much, does he? Anyway, whatever. Here's ads. Ah, uh, and we're back. So Mary Schmitz is, to give you an idea of like how people view her in the conservative movement, her nickname is the Phyllis Schlafly of the West. So this Ooh, family, they're that's just- that's bad. Yeah, that's horrible. Oh my God. Just two real powerful right-wing <laughs> ghouls. Yeah. Oh Lord, of the West. And very soon these people, you know, they're state level figures right now, but very soon they're going to be in the halls of real power. Throughout this whole time, mid-60s and stuff, the Senate representative for the district that John and Mary live in, for, for you know the district that covers Orange County, is this lunatic right-wing hero named James B. Utt, which, yes, does look like James Butt when you type it all out. That is, <laughs> that is the man's name. It they is Utt with two the- T's. <laughs> I know, I know. Like, that's like a joke you would so see some James fucking Butt. dude with a comic make on Twitter. Yeah, no, no, yeah. that's his real fucking name. That's his real fucking No, it's B. Utt. Yeah, B. James B. And Utt. You, you know what? When your name is James B. Utt, you keep the B because you want people to think it's butt. Like, you you relish yeah. in the buttness because you you want to be a little, you want to be an ass, clearly. Yeah, you want, you know what you're going to become. So James Butt, his pet theory is that, quote, a large contingent of barefooted Africans had been snuck into the United States by the United Nations, which is a communist organization. Oh, my to God. Help them take over the, the country. And thing. that's where the, the Watts riots were not Amer- black people born and raised in the United States. They were Africans snuck into Southern California yes. by the United Nations yes. to d- d- it destroy the United States. But this is the same shit. This is the same. Shit yeah. we talk about now, right? And it generally is like the Jews have done this, but it's right. It's like sneaking. They they sneak in the elites, sneak in migrants to rile up the blacks until they want their rights. You know, they're fine with black uh-huh. people as long as they're in their place, as long as they're happily in yeah. ghettos and prevented from you know owning homes. Anywhere near Orange County, of course. Yeah. But yeah, it's the same shit. My God, it's the same shit. And and it's crazy how like they don't see how much they recycle this stuff. And I think Mr. Butt hmm. should get more credit. Yeah, no, that's 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 what we all feel about Mr. B. Utt. So Ud was the son of a rancher. He'd won his seat representing Orange County by attacking his opponent for preaching the gospel of socialism. He believed that the music of the Beatles uh, had inflicted artificial neuroses on young people and given them brain damage. (laughs) He was, I will say this, he was occasionally on the right side of issues, always for the wrong reasons. Um, He opposed the annexation of Hawaii, not on any kind of anti-colonial grounds, but because the islands had too many non-white people and they would inevitably breed with white people. Yes! Um, that's that, what, yeah, he is, he is in his, his can family. Can we kill them all? Like, no, well, I don't want it. <laughs> well, then I don't want to admit it here. <laughs> um, when his grandson decided to oppose the Vietnam War, Ut said that he would have rather seen the boy die overseas. Oh, wow. He is just a giant piece of shit. This He's is the congressional, the, the, feder- the national congressional representative for like the, the district that, that Schmitz lives in. Yeah, and he's he's just... Just a a real bad guy, but extremely popular. He wins in Orange County by a two-to-one majority. Utt is one of the few men in politics who is extreme enough for John Schmitz's tastes. He's basically the only dude who could hold that office and be sure John would not run against him. But then in 1970, tragedy struck. Mm -hmm. James B. Utt died due to complications from being a huge piece of shit. Um, In literal terms, he has a heart attack in church, which you might read as God striking him down (laughs) if you're inclined to that sort of thing. But while one less dead butt is generally good, it also created opportunity for John Schmitz. Uh, Schmitz runs for the former representative seat and wins. Mm. Now, his camp, the, the slogan that he uses to like win this special election, it's impenetrable today. It's when you're out of Schmitz, you're out of gear. That doesn't mean anything to you, does it? <laughs> what? Is it? Sh- sh- no. I know. Sh- well, it's because. 
he, he works at the bikes? cleaning out beer steins. No, oh. at a beer company. Okay. And there was like, I think the slogan was when you're out of Schlitz, you're out of beer. Oh. Like for some Milwaukee beer. But like he 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 takes this slogan that's very much this like Milwaukee area beer slogan and he repurposes it for a campaign in Southern California. I don't know how this worked. No, and, and the rule of puns, it <laughs> yeah, does not it's work. It's just such a weird idea. <laughs> you can only change one side of the pun. It it, ha- it can't be both. It yeah. can't be when you're out of Schmitz, you're out of gear. When it's if yeah. you're out of Schlitz, you're out of beer. You got to keep Schlitz yeah. or beer in there. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's just it's just nonsense. No one knows what the fuck you're talking but about. But he wins the special election. It works. Yeah. So now this fucking guy is in D.C. and is a full on ass congressman. Uh, he moves his wife and family to the Capitol, and he gets to work extending his unique brand of god-awful politics nationwide. His biggest enemy in government, again, is not some leftist, but his actually Richard M. Nixon, who Schmidt saw, you guessed it, as basically a commie sleeper agent. From that article in Cafe.com. Matters were made more tense given that he was President Nixon's congressman, representing the Orange County district containing San Clemente. Schmitz was particularly critical of Nixon's rapprochement with China, telling the press, I have no objection to Richard Nixon going to China. I just object to him coming back, which is actually pretty good. (laughs) That's good That's not bad. Um, Schmitz vocally backed Ashbrook's attempt to primary Nixon in 1972. And so this is something that pisses off Richard Nixon. He is Schmitz has made it his business to become a thorn in his side. And he starts to expand in this period of time outside of like harboring these kind of economic grievances and even grievances against like, you know, communist states to this more sort of esoteric conspiracy theory conservatism. Hmm. In 1971, he writes an introduction to Gary Allen and Larry Abraham's None Dare Call It Conspiracy. The book, which was in hugely, this is influential, this is like the, the center of Alex Jones's ideology today. The book argued that Eastern American elites, particularly the Jews therein, were funding global communism. Mm-hmm. Allen proclaimed, among other things, that Chase Manhattan Bank President David Rockefeller had personally fired Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev in 1964. <laughs> Jesus. What? You, you know, the Chase Bank guy has has the has the, fired the, the codes for hacking the Soviet Union. Who could be more influential in Soviet politics than the head of Chase Manhattan Bank? Oh my God. It is so funny. Again, I mean, who is the head of Chase Manhattan Bank? Was it a Jew? Again, with these like broad, like anti-Semitic thing, like just like the yep. history of this. It's just like and, and the like superpowers that racists and bigots, anti-Semites apply to Jews is just wild. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it really is. Then he hacked into the I mean, again, and it's just the Jewish space laser, Marjorie Green, the Rothschild, the same shit, same shit. Absolutely. Now, if you know anything about Dick Nixon. And I know an unfortunate amount about Mm -hmm, the man. You do. You know that his chief personality trait was that he could not let go of a grudge, right? That is the main thing that defines Richard Nixon. If he is angry at you once, he is angry at you for all time. Now, Nixon, again, he's, he, he remembers his fucking enemies. And so in 1972, Schmitz has just finished backing an attempt to primary Nixon. He's been yelling at him the whole time, two years he's been in Congress. Tricky Dick is like, well, this guy's up for re-election. I'm not going to let that son of a bitch fuck with me anymore. Uh-huh. He turns his petty man-child laser on John Schmitz, and he blasts his career in national politics to smithereens. John loses the primary nomination to a tax assessor, which Hell is yeah. basically, I kind of wonder if Nixon did that on purpose because there's no one worse you can lose to as a libertarian <laughs> a liber- yeah. than a tax assessor. <laughs> I'm happy about this. Yeah, fuck this guy. I mean, yeah, yeah, does it that is mean funny. we like Nixon? But no, but you know, no, no, no. But I, I respect Nixon's ability to both be petty and wield power effectively enough to squash this motherfucker like a bug. Right? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. you just have to take some satisfaction in it. Like absolutely, Nixon beat everybody else, but at least these son, this son of a bitch didn't get a fucking like hand up on well, him. Well, that's know? the other thing is that um, I feel like the right now is like, oh god, maybe I should cater more to the John Birch Society, or maybe I should cater more to the far right, or maybe I should change up my tune. And it's like, nah, you know. It it takes a certain SOB to be like, no, fuck you. I'm the president. I'm doing what I want. 
and yeah, I'm going to kill your career. There you go. Like, I, I don't know. I yep. respect that. I respect that more than I respect someone who's like just going to be, uh, yeah, cajoled by the most extremist yeah. elements of their own party and literally stands up for nothing and cannot yeah. lead. And I'm not even talking Trump. Yeah. Uh, I, I think just broadly the Republican Party, what it's become. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least Nixon, there was this like animal cunning at work with the man. Sure. You had to at least respect in the same way you respect a tiger in the woods, you know, (laughs) as opposed to just like a horde of uh, fucking javelina that have gotten drunk on prairie wine, uh, which is (laughs) how I feel today. So Schmitz was adamant that this was all a conspiracy, you know, when he loses his reelection. And Nixon had flexed his influence and done it specifically to embarrass Schmitz. And that is probably what happened, right? Sure. Schmitz is like, the president had his henchmen come out and get me. And honestly, this is the one conspiracy Schmitz believed in that like, oh, yeah, there is no world in which Dick Nixon did not destroy this man for hitting him from the right. That is totally in character for Richard Nixon. Yeah. And you would have done the same. So- Now, the thing here, this is really a case of you've got Schmitz fucks with Nixon. Nixon being a petty bitch, like destroys his his chance at getting reelected. And then but the thing is, like Schmitz is also extremely petty. So when Nixon nuked his hopes of staying in Congress, John Schmitz starts scheming. Fate presents him with an opportunity in the form of a bullet, uh, which an assassin fired in the body of George Wallace, the segregation governor. Wallace Mm -hmm. is badly hurt and he has to drop out as a presidential candidate for the American American Party. Now, I know what you're saying, Francesca. The American Party isn't a thing, but it was. It did like, used woo-hoo. to be. Um, it, yeah, yeah. This is this is now deep political lore here for the country. But it was a third party that was formed entirely to support the ambitions of George Wallace. Right. Like if the fact that Goldwater isn't just saying slurs on stage doesn't means you don't trust enough. Goldwater. And if the fact that Nixon isn't completely out of his mind means you won't vote for Nixon, the American Party has got your back. Right. Thank God. We love you. Just a little slur. Only a bit of slurs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, more than a bit. This is George Wallace. So now Wallace is to the right of Goldwater, even to the right. Eh, I don't know. Even to the right. Like they're just kind of saying he's just cruder. Right. Okay, I think is it. probably a better way. Okay. He is more. Di- I don't think Goldwater like he is more directly motivated by racism, but they are both they're both of their campaigns are pretty race baity. Right. Yeah. 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 And the American, and this is, you know, Goldwater, I think is 64. This is 68. Um, Mm -hmm. And in the 68, well, the 68 election is when the American party runs for the first time. And it does really well. They get 10 million votes in the 1968 election, right? Um, And that's, that. this is, it comes to something that's kind of relevant today, which is that, you know, we're, we're starting 2024, which is this presidential race is going to be the first race in a very long time where a third party candidate seems likely to win a lot of votes, Right. Um, you talking the, about RFK? The, the Kennedy. Yeah, 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 yeah. The new Kennedy that we got up in politics. He's going to get, I don't think enough, to, like certainly not enough to win the presidency, but uh, more he like he is votes. he is polling better than a third party candidate has in a time like since I've been, you know, aware of politics. Right. That's yes. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think we're going to find his Vax card at some point. He's got a Vax card. It, it's possible. It's all going to be over. Yeah. Anything could happen. It's January is, you know, <laughs> but um, I, I, I it, it is like at the moment right now, he is a more a bigger factor in the election than a third party has been in, in quite a bit. Right. Sure. But I, I, I'm, I'm bringing this up because I want to talk about how significant the American Party was for a brief period of time. They get 10 million votes in the 68 election today. The Libertarian Party in the U.S. has 732,000 registered voters. The Green Party and Constitution Party together are another 350,000, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Ross Perot got about 20 million votes in 1992, but he was a billionaire and he had the money to finance a sizable campaign. In the next election, he he barely broke 8 million votes. So Wallace's American Party... It's not going to win the election, but it can it can spoil the election for a Republican. Ten million votes, that kind of potential, having done that in the previous election, that's not something to scoff at. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, No. Yeah. So, you know, that's interesting. Um, So the American Party is not this inconsiderable thing within U.S. politics at the time, not entirely. And any candidate who could perform at the level Wallace uh, had might be able to take away enough votes from Nixon to assure his reelection. Schmitz wanted to be that man. 
the fact that he might be able to wrench the Republican Party for the because again, you know, if you force Nixon out, right, if you make him lose the election, then the fact that you got that many votes might is going to convince a lot of Republican leadership. Okay, we need to speak to some of the issues that this yeah. guy is adopting, yeah. right? That's I think his assumption, right? That I can wrench this party to the right, um, and I can hurt Nixon, who I hate and who was a communist anyway. <laughs> he gets the nomination for the American Party at that party convention that year. And he, he's, you know, I, I'm actually going to read a quote from that cafe.com article again about like how he kind of frames his campaign. Uh, Schmitz continued to tie himself to conspiracy theories. He made much use of his connection to none dare call it conspiracy, which by election season had blown up, selling 5 million copies. Gary Allen even came aboard the campaign, providing his mailing lists accumulated from the book's success. He also suggested Arthur Bremer. Wallace's would-be assassin was part of a cadre of killers, which also included Lee Harvey Oswald, James Earl Ray, and Sir Hans Sirhan that was secretly funded and trained by left-wing groups like the Students for a Democratic Society. Sure. Schmidt summed up his basic presidential campaign pitch. I boiled down our platform to a two-plank platform. There's a foreign plank that says never go to war unless you plan on winning, and a domestic plan that says those that work ought to live better than those who don't. Right? Which is both not politics and also real easy to see why that spreads among a certain chunk of the country. Right? Oh, yeah. So, cool stuff. You know what else is cool? Oh, I know what's cool. Ads. Sure. The nice, cool breeze of capitalism blowing down our backs. And we're back. How are you feeling, Francesca, about all this Republicaning? Yeah, it's a lot of Republicaning. I'm feeling overwhelmed but fascinated by all of this. I yeah. wish we had... The countervailing force on the left to do uh, shit like this, but we don't. But I love, yeah, the evolution of the, the the right's thinking really hasn't evolved at all. Yeah, I mean, this is really the evolution of the right's yeah. thinking, right? Like it, the evolution of the modern right is so much where this guy was back then. But the broader Republican Party adopts a lot of those attitudes in part because Schmitz it kind of cracks that wall between Orange County and the rest of the country. In right. A lot well, of because it's simultaneously, um, it seems like Orange County is, it is just so isolated from the rest of the country that yeah. is turning on things like the Vietnam war that is for yeah. things um, like not just integration, but like civil rights. Civil rights. Yeah. Exactly. Like actual civil rights. And certainly more so than OC is. Yeah. And an awakening and just more culturally, like there is a backlash, of course, against like conservatism of your parents and whatnot. There's like free speech movements, you know, like whatever, you know, hippie movement, drug culture, whatnot. Like there's a whole rejection of this bullshit, which is why Reaganism was such a fucking blow. So was Nixonism, Nixonianism. Mm -hmm. uh, so was Dixism. Yeah. But yeah, it it is is interesting to have uh, Schmitz come in here and get that many votes. And then also with such a simple platform. I believe in money, money, number one and yeah. uh, white people. I mean, uh, private property. Yeah. Money, but just for the people who are already rich exactly. uh, and bombing people who do not live here. Like that's that's his, his plank, right? It's a perfect encapsulation of right wing isolationism, you know, which is if you're going to fight a war, yeah. make sure you win it, which is the if you're going to go to war in the Middle East, take all the oil. Right. It's that yeah. like it's coded as isolationist, but it's really not. It really is, as we talk about, like super pro war, just kill them all dead, deader than dead. Yeah. Kill them all, take their stuff. Yeah. yeah. Now, for a running mate, uh, he picks a guy named Tom Anderson, who is a farm magazine publisher who was far right, but also not the kind of guy who's going to detract attention from the main show. Mostly I take pictures of cows, cows lounging. Mm -hmm. It's livestock. Yeah. Uh yeah. Just looking pretty. It's like a right wing livestock magazine. I think it's an early homesteading magazine, right? <laughs> okay. Where you're saying we need to go back to the land, drop out of society. Because like like yeah. a guy who takes pictures of cows, I would that that sounds like a cool dude. This but that sucks. Yeah, he got drawn into this mess. Yeah. Yeah. Poor guy. What a bummer. Um, so his campaign manager is Dan Smoot, who's a former FBI agent who's oh. obsessed with the Council on Foreign Relations. Oh. And because this was fucking California, his finance director is actor Walter Brennan, who had won <laughs> three Best Supporting Actor Oscars. So what a, what a that's group. this guy's bench. Yeah. yeah what, what a crew. 
They had better celebrities, though. I feel like all the celebrities you mentioned are like at least best. So they, at least they won best supporting. Yeah, he seems to have been an actor. I don't know. Exactly. I, I can't recall anything he it's was not in, like but Gina Carano now or fucking uh, no, no, no. Tim Brewer, Jim Brewer, whatever the fuck his name is. Yeah, it was Jim. Brewer it's Jim. And, you know, who cares? Whatever. It's Jim. Yeah. So the campaign was immediately aggressive, uh, filled with wealthy small business owning middle aged men who were just desperate to get to feel like they were like insurgent revolutionaries. One American <laughs> party official told a journalist, this party is a distillation of the John Birch Society, the Christian Crusade and the Minutemen. We're revolutionaries. Oh. We're getting together to try to work through the system. But I'll say this, we'll have constitutional government in this country and if we don't get it through a ballot box, we'll get it in the streets. <laughs> that's what the constitution would want. Again, that's very much that like J6 attitude. Yeah. It is. We're going to work through all of our daddy issues together. If we lose an election, we have the right to kill people, right? Like, that's what he's saying. And Schmitz knew that he had an uphill battle in getting elected, uh, or more to the point, stopping Nixon from getting reelected. His brand of paranoiac, utterly fantastical conservatism was not popular nationwide, but he was tailor-made for media sound bites, which helped to keep him in the news. He told ABC... The Nixon family motto is, be sincere whether you believe it or not. He presaged both Donald Trump with his meaner lines and the presidential campaign and personal brand of Ronald Reagan with folksy right-wing witticisms like this. Do you know why a newborn baby cries? Because he's naked, he's hungry, and he already owes the government $5,900 in taxes. Which is funny because, like, well, that baby already owes a private corporation thousands of dollars for being born that's because exactly that's what it right. costs to be fucking born in this this system you people insist on continuing to have for us and jesus for dying for its sins according to them yeah in cafe.com david cordlander writes quote the wall street journal offered a piece entirely devoted to schmitz's rhetorical flourishes entitled keep them laughing is the motto as john schmitz runs for president the piece even referred to schmitz as sort of the bob hope of the ultra right well, oh God, what an what an unappealing series of words. <laughs> His mix of jokes, conspiracies, and righteous indignation at everything he deemed the political establishment garnered decent returns. He managed to get himself on the ballot in 32 states, even as Wallace refused to formally endorse him. Mm. And in the decades to come, this kind of style of far right populist conspiracy messaging, really the fact that he is marrying outright conspiracy theories to an attempt at mainstream politics, this is now dominant, right? This is the dominant form of yeah. conservatism. To be honest, it's not not dominant on the left as well, just in a different direction. But like conspiracism is so mainstream now. Mm -hmm. And we all get together in the Epstein conspiracy. That's where we meet. Yeah. <laughs> That's left, where we right. meet. It's, for a, it's the Serengeti of conspiracies. For a little while. For a little while, yeah. and then we all go our separate ways. Yeah. <laughs> then we decide we we want to be angry at specific people on that plane differently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. I do think we should do a squid game for all of the people in the Epstein books. And we oh, agree yeah. to pretend whoever survives didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> or their children, you know. Um, uh -huh. yeah. Send their children there. Sort of like the Hunger Games, but for the rich. Um, yeah, I do like Shit. I do think that, it'd be that fun would make a lot of money as a TV show. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, God, don't get me started on that, that TV show. And Netflix is awful. But I would I love him. But I do want to hear what Chomsky has to say, because he apparently was also a uh, an associate. But no, more importantly, I want to hear what Kate Blanchett mm -hmm. has to say. I really actually want to see hear mm -hmm. what she has to say. Like, what the hell? My sure. girl. Yeah, I want to hear. You I, I want them all to have to say Cameron something. Cameron Diaz, girl, um, what? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he did do Epstein did do a lot of flights to like I anything that would get famous people on his plane to like different galas and shit overseas. But I don't know, maybe can I, can I, I, I have trouble imagining Cameron Diaz wanting to buy whatever he was selling. But who knows? <laughs> who knows? I think it's <laughs> yeah. just like everyone who was famous in the year 2002. Yeah. <laughs> that is a lot of them, but a lot of those people are also sex. Cra it's it's a mix. <laughs> this is it's a mix. It's a really it's a grab bag. It's, anyway, we're we're getting off yeah. topic, but uh, but but yeah, the conspiracy theory, yeah, that wasn't. It's interesting that though it, it also is the media because he and his wife are also media figures, so it's the marriage of the media yes. figures, good sound bites, which is what you need, or at least what the media wants, mm -hmm. and the conspiracy. Yeah, it's one of those things where he has 
predicted where things are going. But also at his time, the Republican Party is not ready for that, right? He mm -hmm. does not succeed in his time because it's just not, you can't win nationally, even among Republicans doing that quite yet. Um, that's not really going to be possible until you've had a few generations of Rush Limbaugh and Andrew Breitbart and et cetera, propagandizing to the masses. That said, he doesn't do badly. He takes in 1.2 million votes, which is an amount vastly higher than nearly any third party candidates get today, but also well short of what Wallace did. In his concession speech, Schmitz aptly identified that Republican influencers would use his techniques to win support of the dedicated maniacs who made up his base in the future. We got one million votes, enough to strike fear in some hearts in this country. He's not wrong there. He saw this as a good start. Uh, he was at the time the seventh most successful third party candidate in US political history. And his plan was to double down, get back into Congress and weld together a coalition of the deranged that could lurch the Republican party to the right and act as a constant thorn in Dick Nixon's side. They were not aware at this point that uh, Nixon was gonna get shit canned. Coalition of the deranged is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, well, it's what's going on here, right? While he plotted, his wife organized her campaign against the Equal Rights Amendment and scored a job on TV as a political pundit. Things were going great for the Schmitzes. They had power, money, and growing influence. Soon, in 1973, John Schmitz, who's again a family values candidate, right? That's a big part of this degeneracy oh, in the know. modern era oh, is ruining our kids. Oh, yeah. well, he wants. Then you know what comes next. Oh, I he do. Gets, he gets I himself do. a mistress. Yes, now, yes. This guy is both a creepy politics dude, but also a professor. So, of course, his mistress is one of his former students, the no. much younger Carla Stuckel. He is like 50 now. She's like in her late 20s. Um, oh. And he starts sleeping with his student, Carla Stuckel, former student. Uh, and then he fathers two children with her over the space of a few years. And while he's doing that, Mary Schmitz is doing her Phyllis Schlafly routine. She's going on TV. She's organizing the fight against the equal rights and them that are helping to, you know. Um, and while, you know, he is seeing his mistress and she is becoming a media influencer, you know what no one is doing? Watching their fucking kids. And this is going to end in tragedy. Oh, no. One August afternoon in 1973, both parents are out and their daughter, Mary Kay, a sixth grader, had been put in charge of the baby, Philip. Time out, time out. First of all, that's totally not a, not, you can totally do that. No, this is family one, family two. What are we talking about? We're talking about mistress's family? We're talking about Mary. No, no, his 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 uh, family one, family OG one. Fam. Right? Oh, OG fam. His family daughter one. from family one, Got Mary it. Kay who I told you to keep an eye on, not for I, this, uh, although this plays into why you okay. need to remember Mary Gay. <laughs> they have her watching the baby while he is having sex with his former student and uh, Mary is on TV, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna quote from the LA Times here. The baby was a fearless three-year-old and when he took off his life jacket and stepped into the deep end of the pool, not even the diligent Mary Catherine playing in the shallow end with her older brother Jerry noticed the tiny splash. Only oh. after their mother began looking for Philip was he found lifeless on the bottom of the pool. Oh, oh God. So that's bad. Yeah. Pools. Not great. And I mean, people yeah. who are not wealthy enough to have this problem don't know, but uh, like yeah. me, but apparently pool, pool, yeah. pools are total death traps. There's like one of the leading killers mm -hmm. of babies. Of course it is. <laughs> They're not like, like, that's not even surprising. Yeah. I mean, guns are really trying. It's just a thing for a small person to drown in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Guns are truly trying to like, I think it might be neck and neck. It might actually be guns mm -hmm. at this point, but pools. Oh, I think guns like, probably beat them at this point. Yeah. Guns sadly. are much more affordable than a pool. I Everybody know. can have a gun. <laughs> I know. <laughs> If only pools were as accessible. <laughs> we could be drowning far the more tragic babies. Case brought, <laughs> yeah, we could really up those numbers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is tragic, obviously, and it brings Schmitz a lot of sympathy, partly because nobody knew that the reason he had not been there to watch his baby is that he was having sex with a woman, not his wife, who was also his former student. You know, if people had known that he was a fraud as a moral paragon and that his son had maybe died in part due to his ambitions, uh, they might not have uh, uh, felt as positively about him, though. But this doesn't come out immediately, right? And through the mid-1970s to the early 80s, Schmitz, you know, continues to run. He gets back into state Congress. He's in California Congress for another term. He makes another national-level campaign. And he becomes more comfortable 
uncomfortable broadcasting openly racist remarks on the campaign trail. After lawyer Gloria Allred gives him a leather chastity belt during a state senate committee on abortion, and Gloria is like making fun of him. She he's they're doing a, they have a state senate committee in california on like abortion laws and obviously it. she's gloria allred she thinks it should be legal and he is being a howling fascist about it and saying no women shouldn't have the right to have sex oh, right and allred. so she gives him a chastity belt right i love it which mm-hmm. which actually he needs it's like it a seems. joke she doesn't yeah. even know that he's fathered yes, a yes. whole other he, family he, he literally does she has actually anticipated a real yeah. need yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> like, so um, he issues a uh, a press release calling Gloria and other pro-choice activists, quote, a sea of hard Jewish and arguably female faces. <laughs> there wow. it is. There it is. There, there he said it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He did it. He did it, everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's there. a backlash to this. Like, sure. even in even in the 70s, <laughs> you can't say this. <laughs> like, um, So there's a backlash. And his response to the backlash is basically to say, I don't hate Jews. They're like everyone else, except more so, which is still pretty racist. <laughs> they're like everyone else, except uh-huh. I'm sorry, more what? so. I'm, I'm... So they're not like everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? I mean, uh, I, it's I, it's something people used to say it about uh, the Japanese too. I think it's like a classier way of saying they're not like regular people, right? I think it's what you say too when the group you're afraid of has a reputation, at least for like being powerful in an industry or in some other way, right? You know, Japan is a military power, and people are saying that about Japan. Right. Um, there's this widespread attitude that Jewish people run certain, and I think that's kind of what he's saying, right? Uh huh. It's, so it's the polite company bigotry. Yes. Yes. It is the polite way of saying, I think the Jews run the media. Right. Yeah. That, like that is basically what he's saying. He also he did not just confine himself to talking about Jewish people. He said of Latinos, I may not be Hispanic, but I'm close. I'm Catholic with a mustache, <laughs> which is what a wild thing to that's say. Like, yeah, that's what a, that's what a, a dad or that's what a guy on Cinco de Mayo says. Like, yes, when yes, he's absolutely. Wearing like a nacho bowl, like sombrero. Yeah. And calling yeah. every waiter Very, Pedro. Yeah. Um, he also called Martin Luther King Jr. a notorious liar. He had regained a Senate seat in 1978, but he failed in two campaigns to win election to the U.S. Senate. By 1982, he had been thoroughly relegated to the status of a local headache. And then <laughs> in 1982, a month after losing yet another primary election, the news broke that Schmitz had fathered two children with his mistress. <laughs> now, you want to know how this news broke? Because this is a fucking story. Oh, yes. Kay, it's Mary. Uh-huh. It, invo- Mary. it involves a penis injury. So, oh, no. um, not a good one. This is a child's penis injury. Um, so, nobody <laughs> laugh. You're not allowed to laugh. If you just had laughed before, feel bad about it right now. <laughs> yeah, Pause now this you're thinking about for 30 seconds. Dicks. Reflect on your crimes. Yeah. Yeah. You sickos. So, his. <laughs> Also, this is kind of a sicko thing. He names his second son out of wedlock after his father. No. <laughs> Which is a weird move. <laughs> like, For your kid, you're going to deny the rest of his life, but okay. Like, you have to have a little bit of deniability. Like, if your wife finds out, but like, that's not mm-hmm. my kid. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's named ab- after it's, your dad. It's named after your dad. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah. Its name is Schmitzy Ditzy. Um, like, come on now. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and it's, you know, the reason this all comes out. So he's got this kid, John George, who is a baby at this point. And the baby gets booked at an OC hospital for an injured penis. Okay. Um, the injury is very peculiar. A piece of hair had been wrapped, and it's described as being wrapped in a square knot around, I think, the head of the penis so tightly that it had nearly severed the member, right? Oh, God. So the baby has to have surgery. Yeah, it's fucked up. But the, the baby's fine. Like it does, it, he does recover, right? But the incident prompted, obviously, an investigation, right? That's the kind of thing that looks like it could be something intentional, right? Someone hurt mm-hmm. this kid, you know? I, I think they're perfectly reasonable to look into this. Detectives threatened to arrest the baby's mother, Carla Stuckel, if she didn't tell them who the father was. And I think this is the police assume if someone's abusing this child, it's probably the dad. 
So okay. we need to figure out who the dad is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, they're I've, like, look, I've, we'll arrest that. you if you don't tell us. And that's how Schmitz, get, his name gets out, right? Because <laughs> he's famous, right? He's their local. He's you know, been their rep a couple of times. He's this big I'm, figure. So and I'm a it, mom. So I know like there, I've, I see all these Instagram posts and some of them are like careful with, you know, stray hairs because I guess hairs yeah you know when like a hair gets like wrapped around your finger like that can happen and it can like hurt and it's hard to like cut it or break it just random things reasons for parents to worry random shit but like getting it on your dick (laughs) like I don't believe in God but I'm pretty sure God put that (laughs) piece of hair around oh god (laughs) that is kind of the shitty thing god would do instead of just strike john schmitz down make a baby suffer to ruin his career (laughs) fucking asshole (laughs) like that that is that you're right that is very old testament god (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) so you know the story breaks i'm sure the police just can't keep their mouth shut or whatever but like it breaks and it craters john as a political figure this is the end of his his like meaningful public life he makes another congressional run in 1983 but he loses by more than 50 points the affair was such a scandal that it also ends mary schmitz's career on tv which is a kind of of evidence of some misogyny right because like this isn't her fault right <laughs> that her husband cheated on her with a lady but she loses her job on tv as a right-wing shithead anyway i guess it's unjust she does suck so you know take think about that how you want i guess the two separate but they get back together uh true to his nature is human garbage schmitz never supports carla stuckle or helps to support their he refuses to pay right he is like this his whole life when the police question him he tells the police straight up i do not and will not support him financially because the police are like do you want to help pay the bill at the hospital for your son he's like i will not pay any money it is her responsibility to take care of him not mine gotta love republicans part of your personal responsibility yeah indeed (laughs) i mean at least i will give him this they he didn't like you know advocate for stealth abortion the way other republicans do with their mistresses right no he 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 has the kid and then he i mean he was anti-abortion but he does have his kid yeah. Or he, and then allows him kid. to live a life of like, you know, uh, a shitty life where his dad doesn't hug him or support him or love him the way Republicans it, want in order to breed more Republicans. Guess what? You've you're ahead of the game again, Francesca. OK, these kids have a nightmare life. Yeah. Carla Stuckle is left to support both children on her own. This is actually did you watch the House of Usher? No. Oh, well, these two kids have literally the background of the kids. I I honestly wonder if that's who, uh, what's his name, was thinking of. when he, Anyway, so Carla is left to support these kids on her own, which she does until 1993 when she dies due to complications from type 1 diabetes. Oh, she had boy. been like working, barely ga- keeping it together to take care of these two on her own. And then she dies. Schmitz refuses to take either of his children and they're sent to an orphanage. Oh, John my Schmitz fucking lives, God. Yeah, it's fucked what up. A- piece yeah. of shit yeah yeah okay he just like not my responsibility not my job Jesus. her body made him fuck her like it's it's that's him uh he lives on increasing increasingly angry and irrational until 2001 when he dies of prostate cancer the journal of historical review which exists to deny the holocaust called him a good friend in its obituary um he's a just a cool guy. He is, by the way, a Holocaust denier. He he attends events <laughs> held he by the Journal of Historical Review. <laughs> of course he is. He had to get the bingo card. Yeah, yeah you know? exactly. He had to complete it. Yeah. And that's almost the end, Francesca, because oh we got one God. button on this episode. Oh yes, yeah, Sophie God. just read it. <laughs> Wait, now, I, think, I mentioned uh-huh, at the mm-hmm. start, I mm-hmm. mentioned at the start, mm-hmm. remember his daughter, remember. Mary Kay. Yes, right? yes. Yeah. Oh, Schmitz is the daughter him. that he had with his wife, right? Who Starts is a there when line. her baby brother dies. Yeah, yeah, which probably fucks her up somewhat. So in between John getting exposed as a philandering fraud and dying while he's still alive, something else happened. Not oh to him, God. but to his daughter, Mary Kay. She becomes a middle school teacher and she marries someone. I want you, do you want to guess what the last name of her husband is? Becomes her last name? No. No, I it's don't Letourneau. want. It's Letourneau. Mary Kay Letourneau. That's John Schmitz's daughter. Now, depending on how oh. much you know about this story, some oh, of you are saying, oh, shit. 
God. Wait, I actually Kay don't gets... know this story, but this... Oh, but... oh, God. <laughs> oh, oh, she's... Yeah, she's... in like the mid-90s, yeah. Mary Kay Letourneau, I think it's the mid-90s, Mary Kay, Kay Letourneau gets famous because she starts, she's a school teacher, a middle school teacher, and she repeatedly statutorily rapes one of her 12-year-old male students oh and has two God. children with him. Oh, my and fucking God. This, gets public and she it it is a massive national news story this is front page news right, tv right. news ev- like on every household for weeks for the first time the a woman a Turner. female teacher is a predator and you prob- <laughs> but, you've probably you've yeah. probably seen the clips of like them when they're older and her being like who is yeah. the boss and him being like what the fuck and Rin like they yeah, are, yeah, it's so... because they go on to like get <sighs> married and yeah. have like a normal. Oh, they do, yeah. Well, she's I mean, pregnant she, the, in yeah. prison and then makes yeah, it's ho- it's really dark. It's, oh it's my god, a fucked up story. She died horribly um, though, so that's cool. She does die really badly. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's John Schmitz's primary legacies are that he helped create the modern Republican Party that we're all desperately hoping doesn't kill everybody today. Um, and he uh, gave birth and raised Mary Kay Letourneau, who became one of the most famous pedophiles in this country's history. So, Oh my that's good. God. <laughs> Robert, Robert, I was not you ready. You didn't see that one coming, did you, I'm Sophie? I'm telling you. I was not ready for that last paragraph. Oh this my turn. God. <laughs> Surprise pedophile in the fourth quarter, baby. Oh my god! Thank, thank you for knowing what the fourth quarter is. Um, mm-hmm. Wow, um, they breed. This is the these are the kinds of people they breed. Mm. This wow. is what happens. Yeah, I mean, if you, I see mean, you the- know what? I will. Mary Kay Letourneau is a bad person, but having your parents Terrible be fascists yeah. who neglect you and kind of put you in a situation where you are responsible for your infant brother or your child brother's death couldn't have helped like that couldn't didn't have that didn't make the odds of her turning out healthy better right no and also like we don't know whatever like some other shit might have happened you know what i mean sure yeah i mean like, who knows exactly like something else might have happened to her she is bad and so is he she's bad yeah. she There's, she's very bad she's the whole terrible. i mean curse they're so yeah. cursed also sounds like a dog shit family yeah it's a very Mm -hmm. dog shit family robert i think this is the first time in like a really long time that i've been extremely surprised at the end of yeah you didn't see that one coming at all did you so i wish i was more up on my on my child rapist (laughs) there's a there's a there's a lot of clips going around because there's a uh netflix movie that's loosely based based off the story called may Mm -hmm. december yeah um, good stuff good yeah. stuff i i just know this is one of those episodes that like the instant i said that across the country like th- th- hundreds of thousands of people all went oh fuck really <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> I, Damn. Think, I, think I did I- not like it was it's it's such a funny bookend for this story not funny because like a child an actual child was deeply deeply harmed here more than one a lot of children actually are armed in this story yeah. but just it was not not oh what you expect with, with the first 90 percent of this story yeah for it it's, to a, end it's, with. A, it's a fun distraction from the rest of it which is like the origins of like the far yeah. right and the da 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 hey Letourneau mm-hmm. like that's I like yeah. it Took wow a that child the abuse end. was really refreshing yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> really exactly cleanse my palate from all the other stuff mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah it's like that sip of water when you're doing a wine tasting <laughs> That's yeah, for sure. <laughs> for okay, sure which, this cleanser. is probably not a road to go down. No, 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 do not. But um, hey, uh. look, they got a Netflix show. I mean, movie. So. Oh yeah, no, I'm gonna be watching that tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor Schmitz uh-huh. doesn't get a special. So, Francesca Fiorentini. You have a podcast, The Bituation Room, which yeah, people should I, listen to. I have been on it. You have. You were great. You were there in person. I'm doing another live show mm-hmm. on uh, January 28th, 7 mm-hmm. p.m. at the Gateway Theater in San Francisco as a part of SF Sketchfest. And Miles Gray is going to be there. And thank you so much. And now I'm going to sh- just sit Hell in yeah. shame that I didn't know who Mary Kay Letourneau was. And I was just 
It's now okay. I have, it's okay. It's okay. I time. double knew it. I double knew <laughs> <Okay>. it. <laughs> so it'll be made up. You've for got me. time before Sketchfest to really, really <laughs> work on some Mary Kay Letourneau <laughs> jokes. You know what? If you just find David Letterman's monologues from back then, exactly. you can I'll steal just, some. No one I will, will notice. Steal them. <laughs> and Cat Williams will call me out for it. It'll be great. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's been. Oh, this Francesca, has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And th- that was anything else you want to uh, tell people? No, man, just listen to the Bituation Room. There's a comic and a. Oh, yeah. There's always a comedian. There's always an expert or an activist. We talk politics and kind of big, what the fuck are we going to do in 2024 stuff? So it's good. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's it's useful. You, you're, the Bituation Room has an, uh, a, a style that is cathartic to it. And if you think you need that right now as we start to head into 2024, it's a great place to get it. Um, so Thank you. Listen to some of that. Relax. I don't will feel never too bad relax for again. laughing about <laughs> the. Yeah, no. Oh <laughs> you never know God. where Mary Kay Letourneau is going to be hidden in an episode. So Wait, best- I could do that any day. I oh my like God. The, my face is a different shade. That's how shocking. Yeah, that was. no, so- it, it's like how you know you I may mean, have American history before J six and after. We're like, oh wow, now a coup could just happen at any time. It's real to us. Been- now the possibility of being confronted with Mary Kay Letourneau is going to be lurking in the back of your mind every episode, Sophie. Uh, it's forever. Been, it's been five or six years. <laughs> And this is the first time where I couldn't close my mouth. <laughs> Just the, pure, the pure shock of the Mary Kay Turno drop. Yeah. Oh my god. See, it's a good way Damn to open right. 2024. It is. I feel like yeah. I feel like I gotta go like hug a dog. <laughs> Let's end this episode. What the fuck? Yeah. yeah. Bye. Yeah. All right, everybody. <laughs> bye bye. Goodbye. Bye. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com. Or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.